Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, sitting in the co-pilot's chair, the lighting programmer and the relationship with the lighting designer presented by Rob Halliday. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit your questions to the presenter and he'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after the presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop series, and you can find that on pro.harman.com. We are adding new sessions weekly, so watch for those on the calendar. And now I would like to introduce you to Rob Halliday, the presenter for today's webinar. Rob works around the world as a lighting designer on projects such as Tree of Codes, and Judizio Universal and as a lighting programmer for other designers working on shows such as Billy Elliot, Mata Hari, Les Miserables, and Miss Saigon, leaving him perfectly placed to reflect on the unique working relationship between these two roles. And now I'll pass it to you, Rob. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm sure you all know this, or you figured it out, but it's slightly weird because it's like, I'd imagine it's like an actor must be actually talking to the stage, which is obviously a thing I never do. Uh, but when you talk into a darkened auditorium and you can't see anybody so it feels a bit like you're talking to yourself so hopefully there'll be bits where you laugh and then i just know, won't know about it um the subject of this is sort of a compendium of all the different worlds that i work in um yeah i started doing theater because lighting seemed like fun and i started as an electrician and i did that for a bit and i was a lighting you know touring electrician tour shows around the world um and at some point I sort of fell into this thing that we now think of as lighting programming, which is sort of being the interface between the lighting designer and what happens on stage. Um, I've done that with lots of different designers, which I think is a brilliant education because effectively you get to see into their minds and be part of their process of making the show work. Um, and I think I've done that for uh, scarily 20 something years now. So with designers like David Hersey, who I've worked with for a really long time, Rick Fisher, uh, the Americans, Ken Billington, uh, Peter Kazarowski, uh, Jules Fisher and Peggy Eisenhower. I mean, all these people who are legends who were doing this for a long time before I came along. Um, who really probably didn't need my help, but I felt very privileged to be there and be part of the work they did on various shows. Uh, shows like Les Mis, the original one, not the new one. Where people involved with the original one don't talk about the new one, the polite company, because we think the original was the best. Uh, Miss Saigon, Billy Elliot, uh, which we were supposed to be doing in Japan this summer, uh, which has been one of the sort of weirdest lockdown things because we ended up um, supervising the lighting remotely via YouTube, which meant every morning at some unearthly hour in the morning, we'd come and watch a live video feed um, to try to give them help with the lighting, which is obviously hard because YouTube is terrible. <laughs> Um, but actually really interesting what you can spot that's gone wrong, even on a sort of low resolution video feed. Um, but also I have to say it only worked because of a brilliant, brilliant crew. So normally if you saw something that wasn't quite right, if you just waited a few minutes, um, they would come along and fix it. I never really wanted to be a programmer. I don't really know what I've ever wanted to do, but maybe I wanted to be a lighting designer and I sway. Um, more recently, I've tried to get back into that because it sort of rewards a different part of your brain or a different part of your creative process. Uh, again, I've been really lucky to be involved with some amazing shows. Tree of Codes, which is this um, Wayne McGregor, Oliver Elias and Jamie XX dance show, which is just one of the best things I've ever worked on. Um, Giudizio, which is this amazing projection based show that we did in Italy a few years ago. Um, I'd imagine that on some of those shows, when I'm working with another programmer, I drive them a bit crazy because I tend to be a bit of a control freak or think I know better than them sometimes. Every now and again, I discover that I don't and I just shut up and relax and get on with the lighting. But all of that has prompted me to start thinking about this sort of interesting relationship between these two jobs um, because I straddle the two of them, which um, I'm going to say in some ways, it, what this is actually a presentation about is sort of the conversations I have with myself while I'm making a show, particularly if I'm doing both jobs at the same time, which I sometimes do. Right, so if we're talking about lighting programmer, um, I think the interesting thing to sort of wind back and start with is where did this job come from? Because it feels like the, the phrase, the expression of lighting programmer is quite a new one. 
Uh, and in some ways it is, but that's just because the job used to be called something else. The jobs always existed. Um, it's just gone by lots of different names. It used to be called the board operator. Um, these fine, finely attired gentlemen are board operators from probably sometime in the 1930s. Um, that's Strand Grandmaster Mechanical Dimmer. Um, I just the note, if you think your lighting desk is hard to work, probably it's not as hard as working one of these where you're directly having to mechanically interact with every dimmer. You're having to, if you want to do a crossfade, you're having to turn that big wheel in the middle, which is mechanically linked to all those other wheels, which all have little clutches. So they can all slip when they hit the right level. All the time, standing right in front of the actual dimming electronics, the resistors, which are in behind that board. So it would have been incredibly hot because of course, all the electricity that you're not sending to the light, you're losing in a big resistor. So you're standing in front of a giant electric fire, trying to do really subtle cues. Um, it looks impossible, but yet, you know, amazing shows came out of that time. What we always do as our board ops programmers, whatever you want to call us, um, is sort of overcome the limits of the technology to get the result that's required on stage. Um, sort of the next generation, you know, this is a thing called the Strand Light Console. Maybe you've seen it, many people haven't. Um, we have one, we've rescued one, the one on the bottom right, actually, which is the one from the Theatre Royal Drury Lane in London, uh, still exists. If you want to come and play on it, won't talk to any lights, but you can come and get the feel of it. Uh, it's an organ converted into being a lighting control. Um, you know, again, kind of amazing to think about, given that we all very often think of ourselves as performing light to music. Um, and yet very often we're doing it through tools that aren't really designed to do that. It would have been fascinating to perform a show, to actually play a light show in effect um, on one of these devices. It would be fascinating to be able to connect this to a modern lighting rig and play the music, play the lights in time to the music. Um, I'd love to make that work. We have a small version which will talk to some DMX lights, but not very many. Um, and it's not quite as impressive as that one. Uh, we jump forward in time a bit. This is the 1960s. This is the National Theatre. So this now you have the dimmers somewhere else and you can move the lighting control out into the auditorium. So that's interesting because now you as the person controlling the lighting can actually put yourself in a place where you can see the lighting. Um, the Grand Master was always in a perch on the side of the stage. So you had a sideways view. Uh, the light console was designed to be moved into the auditorium, but probably nobody ever did because it was too big and heavy. But this, you could put it wherever you wanted. You could be part of the process of making the lighting rather than just being a technician stuck away in a corner of the stage somewhere. Um, and I think that's really important as how this collaboration between the designer, the person who has the vision for the lights, and the board operator, programmer, the person who delivers it on stage, um, they become more intertwined rather than one just dictating instructions to the other. Um, the big jump that obviously has helped all of us is the arrival of computers uh, into dealing with this. So you don't have to write things down on pieces of paper anymore. Um, you know, when the technology is working, you press a button and everything you've done is magically captured. Um, which, you know, sounds so obvious now, but was the revelation that the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s. So this is the National Theatre again in London on the south bank of the River Thames. When the building opened in 1976, uh, top right picture is the Olivier Theatre sort of under construction. Bottom right is the moving lights that they had in that theatre in 1976. So big 2K Fresnels, but with motor yokes on them. Um, and the console is the, the, the controller that was created for this theatre by Richard Pilbro and Strand Lighting, which is called Lightboard, um, which was designed to integrate control of a really big rig. The Olivier Theatre had 800 dimmers thereabouts when it opened and a big permanent rep rig and moving lights um, and colour changers and slide changers. And again, lots of things we think of as new technology, which it turns out have been around for a while. Um, Lightboard is an amazing machine, which I could happily talk about forever, but I won't. But it could do things that current lighting consoles can't do, and therefore current lighting programmers can't really do. And it's really interesting to sort of try and analyze why and why some of those things have been lost along the way. But the most interesting about it was 
it didn't separate, force the separation of the lighting designer and the programmer. If the lighting designer wanted to join in, they could. If they felt there was something they could do that, that was easier for them just to do it, just to grab some lights and mix them together, um, they could. The panel on the right hand side with the four wheels, four black wheels and the white wheel, was called the pallet and you could lift it out and you could put it down in the auditorium on the production desk as we'd now call it in front of the lighting designer the main board couldn't move because it was hardwired to all its computer brains but the designer had an interface to the lights if they wanted um, and they might not have wanted to get involved in the nitty-gritty but they could just grab light and mix it and play with it and then go right i'm going to hand it off back to you you deal with how we then store it and record it and all of that kind of thing Light designers who used this board, which lasted from about 1976 to about 1986, uh, adored it and still talk about it in glowing terms. Uh, this is David Hersey talking about it a couple of years ago, um, saying it was a joy. You could just join in. And when the show was going crazy and you were trying to work really fast, you could all just muck in and get the job done. Um, the big picture is David at the National 1976 with his son, who now has grown up. Um, and in the middle is Alan Jacoby, who used to run Unusual Rigging, who sadly passed away early this year, but who um, was an electrician at the National Theatre when it opened, which is why he always looked after lighting, I'd like to believe. Um, the next stage came when we started adding, more commonly, these lights that could move, um, except we didn't add them. They were really a separate thing. Um, starting effectively with Verilite, um, firstly with their VL1, the original Verilite and its Series 100 console, um, later with the Artisan, uh, which was probably the most impressive looking lighting desk you've ever seen because, you know, it was huge and all the buttons lit up and, you know, in the same way sound operators have that sense of importance because they're standing behind a big giant mixing desk, you always felt you were important when you were standing behind an Artisan. Um, and it did some of the biggest shows in the world. The, the picture on the right is a really bad photograph of the Academy Awards uh, in 1996, which was an all very light rig, I think, all controlled from an artisan. You know, the artisan was designed to control up to 10,000 very lights at a time when 10,000 very lights didn't exist in the world. Um, and because it was such a new special thing and because of the strange politics of the day where they didn't want anybody seeing how any of it worked because they were trying to protect it all with patents. Um, Verilite would also supply the team of people who would come and install the lights and make them work and then supplied the programmer, the Verilite programmer, the person who would come and drive the lights for you. And that was a very small, very special, very unique team of people at a really sort of pivotal moment in lighting history. Um, there always has to be a first. Uh, the first in this case is a guy called Tom Literal. Uh, I, don't, I, I forgot to ask if we were allowed to mention other lighting companies during this, but Tom until recently worked for ETC and he's just retired, I believe, as part of the sort of let's get out of the way while this COVID thing makes the world crazy. Um, but Tom was Verilite programmer number one. So he was the first person to turn on a bunch of lights and make them move together um, and then start taking them out on shows. And that must have been an incredible thing to be. But that was a separate thing. The Verilite desk could only control Verilites, couldn't control anything else. Um, you had to have the Verilite person, it had to use that desk. There was no interoperability with anything else. Other people who were making their own moving lights also had their own desks. Um, but it was separate from the rest of the rig. So very often on a show where you had Verilites and other lights, uh, you would end up with two people running two different lighting desks. You'd have the Verilite operator driving the Verilites and you'd have somebody else running the conventional lights. Um, so for example, Miss Saigon, the original in London in 1989 is a, was an artisan, VL2s and VL4s, and then a Strand Galaxy running everything else. The big change that came was that um, the industry invented this standard way of having things talk to each other, which is called DMX, which is a control protocol that was originally designed to let a lighting desk talk to a bunch of dimmers down a single, effectively a microphone cable. But at the same time, other manufacturers had started making lights that could move. Some of them were uh, homages, knockoffs of the Verilite. Some of them used a different approach where you moved a mirror instead of moving the whole light. 
um, and they adopted DMX as a control protocol. Um, and as soon as that started happening, people started firstly trying to use normal lighting desks to control moving lights, which never worked very well. Uh, and then started adding, either adding moving light functionality to existing lighting desks or building entirely new products, which would only deal with the moving lights. So this little sort of smorgasbord is in the middle is a thing called the uh, Oscar, which is probably the first touchscreen lighting desk. Uh, it's designed for nightclubs and things rather than concerts, but it was sort of a pivotal device because it set some of that interface for controlling things via a touchscreen. It wasn't an LCD, it was a real TV, which is why that box looks so enormously deep. Um, the CompuLight animator from Israel, bottom left, the whole hog one, top left, um, Strand 500 series console that I used for a long time, which added moving light functionality onto a conventional theater desk in quite an interesting way. Um, bottom center, the whole hog two, which sort of set the game for everything we do now with its touchscreen interface um, and the way it deals with selections and palettes. Uh, and on the right, the MA Grandma One console, which was sort of a whole hog made better with color screens and an adjustable screen. Um, now, of course, none of these things could actually control lights on their own. You know, we use this phrase intelligent lighting, but it's, there isn't any intelligence in any part of lighting. It's all down to the people who actually drive the consoles. So now what we have instead of the very light programmer is the moving light program, including Martin's very own Brad Schiller. It's a complete fluke. I chose this photograph because I'd forgotten he worked for Martin now, but he's lurking in the background somewhere. So you, you can ask him about this, which is the Sydney Olympics in 2000. Um, which must have been 20 years ago, about now, I think, kind of amazingly, because I remember watching that um, and being astounded by it. Um, but Brad wasn't alone there. Because the hog couldn't control ultimately that many lights, there were some number of hogs, Brad will answer, but six, eight whole hogs with six or eight different operators, plus a strand desk on the end in the audience light, all working in unison to control what was at the time probably the biggest show on earth. That's the moving light program. The other thing that happens because of this standard is you can start to invent new tools, which also change the way we work. So you can add things like WYSIWYG because a computer can now listen to the control signal and model what the lights are doing. Um, you can have things like autopilot, which was uh, the first sort of, you wear a tracker and all the lights can magically follow you device. Um, all of that is possible through standards. And we're very lucky in the industry that we've had a number of really good people working really hard to make standard protocols that let us do new things. The so DMX early on, ACN, Artnet, things like that now. And we sort of need to keep working on that because it's what's let us become the industry we are, I think. So I started off, I, I sort of missed the very light era. I, I'm artisan trained, but I've never really used it. Um, I sort of came in at the time when you, we were moving light programmers who just dealt with the moving light bit. Um, uh, my first big show was Oliver at the London Palladium in 1994 with David Hersey, um, where I just ran a desk that just ran the moving lights and somebody else just ran a desk that just ran the conventional lights. And we did the same thing for a few more shows after that. Um, but already I'd done some little, well, soon afterwards, actually, 95, we did a little show where there was a rig and only six moving lights. And it was just like, why don't we just do it all on one lighting desk? You know, I think we can, and I think the desk can do it. And I think I can do it. And I don't think it'll slow anybody down. Um, so why don't we just give it a go? Because ultimately it will save the producer money. Um, and I think it will save the lighting designer some sort of aggravation because they no longer have to manage two sets of information. They no longer have Q1 on this desk and Q1 on this desk. They no longer have channel one and let's call it other channel one or channel one and fixture one. You know, you no longer have, if the light design says one at 50, two people going, is that my channel one or his channel one or her channel one? Whose channel one is that? Um, and we sort of expanded that when we did uh, the first British tour of uh, Les Mis in 1997, the first time we used moving lights on the show. Um, not a lot, I mean, I can't remember the numbers, but there were maybe 16 studio colors um, and there were some of David's digital light curtains, but it didn't feel like a lot. And I said, well, I, we just do all of it. 
Oliver, the tour, the next year, we did the same thing. Miss Saigon, when we went to the British tour in the year 2000, we did the same thing. Mary Poppins, uh, London 2004 and New York 2006, which for a time was the biggest rig on Broadway, all running from one lighting desk. Uh, we did the same thing. Um, and it didn't, it felt more sensible to me. Um, and somewhere along the way, they said, what do you need to, what, what are we going to call you in the programme? You know, you're the Verilite programme. And I said, well, I'm sort of not. I think I'm doing everything. So why don't we just call it lighting programmer? Because that's sort of what I'm doing. And that's sort of what the job is. Um, and I can't even remember which show that was. And I can't find the programme. But that is the job title that sort of seems to have stuck. Um, it's entirely possible somebody used that title before me. But it's interesting that that's now become the standard name for everything we do. Um, I had a student recently who said, all oh, right, so basically a lighting programmer is like a board operator with air miles. Um, and that's slightly flippant, but sort of right, because now you take on that role where you're directly involved with production. And if the production goes other places, you tend to get to go with it. Um, it's not always the right approach. You know, if you're doing a really big show, like an Olympic scale show, or a really fast show, like a TV event award show, maybe you want two people or more people so that you can all muck in. But particularly for theatre, which I will immediately say is most of the work I do, it just feels like a more elegant solution. Um, and the fact that it's sort of become the standard on most theatre shows in most places in the world um, I think sort of demonstrates that it is the right approach. Um, it's interesting that New York held out for a really long time, arguing that uh, two people was better, separate conventionals and moving lights. And then I think the 2008 recession came along and suddenly they were all fighting for work and suddenly it felt like a good idea. So they've sort of gone down that route as well. So Hamilton, which is the most amazing piece of lighting that I've seen in a long time is one programmer, David Arch, working with one remarkable light designer, the late Hal Binkley. Um, there's an interesting side question to all of this before we come on to talk about this, the, the relationship a bit more, is of course, why can't the light designers just do it themselves? You know, it, it, it's a bit strange that you're sort of, you have a vision in your head and then you have to describe to somebody else what you want to have happen and they have to deal with it. And it's all about uh, language, trying to turn a visual thing into words that somebody else then has to convert from words back into some kind of technology. Um, would it not be easier if you could just muck in on the lighting desk and do it yourself? Um, sometimes they do. Uh, this is me, in fact, with the director Wayne McGregor doing a show where it just felt easier for me to do it myself and Wayne understood that I could do it by myself without it getting in the way of my lighting designer hat being worn. Uh, rock and roll historically in the olden days when desks were desks and faders were faders and lights could only fade up and down, uh, used to do it themselves. They'd have a big board with a bunch of faders and they'd just grab them and fade them up and down themselves. Um, the fine gentleman in the middle is a slightly younger than he is now, Patrick Woodruff, with direct hands-on control of the desk, which I'm not sure he does so much anymore. Um, it might be better because what we do at the moment is a bit like uh, Da Vinci describing to somebody using AutoCAD uh, that the end result they want is the Mona Lisa. You would get something that sort of looked a bit like the Mona Lisa, but it wouldn't really quite be the same thing. And that's sort of a little bit like the position we're in now, I think. Um, but the reason we don't, I think, is because there's always that moment when, as the lighting designer, the director will come up to you and want to have a conversation. And if you're the designer, you have to stop at that moment and have that conversation. Um, because as soon as you don't do that, and particularly if you're then sitting behind a machine rather than sitting behind a sort of cigarette stained, coffee marked lighting plan, um, you become perceived as a technician rather than let's call it an artist, a lighting artist. Um, and the danger is that as soon as that perception change happens, the conversations you have with the other creative people on the show become different. You know, it stops becoming a conversation about, you know, the motivation of the precise shade of blue in the sky and the distant whatever, but it becomes about make it brighter, 
um, and that isn't very conducive necessarily to being a creative lighting designer involved with the show. Plus, if every time you have to stop and have this conversation, if you're also running the lighting desk, all work stops. As soon as you have somebody else there working with you, you can give them a task to carry on with and you can go have the conversation or you can go talk to the band or you can just sit back and have the idea ready for the next moment in the show, which is the hardest part of lighting. You know, the hardest part isn't pressing buttons really quickly. The hardest part is coming up with the ideas in the first place. Um, and I think that's why generally we've evolved into this situation where lighting is a job um, and then very often the programming, the making it work part is a different job. Since I've done that job for a long time, I'm quite grateful for that. So the title was about this relationship, the co-pilot's chair. Um, and that's how I've come to see the role in many ways is you're the co-pilot to the lighting designer's pilot. You're there sometimes literally to sit next to them um, and to work with them to deliver their thing on stage. But you're more than a co-pilot, you're actually an interface. You know, it's interesting to think about a sort of science fiction minority report, future of lighting, where instead of the lighting programmer, uh, you took like an umbilical cord out of the lighting desk and you stuck it onto the side of the lighting designer's head and whatever they imagined magically appeared on stage. Um, we're not there yet. Maybe we will be one day. But in the meantime, this programmer job is interesting because you're the interface between their vision and all the technology, the lighting desk and then the lights. You have to figure out what it is they want. And then with your skill and judgment and taste, you have to figure out how to deliver it. Um, you're not just a translator. People I know abroad who are translators or interpreters get very frustrated when you use the wrong job title because an interpreter is like a literal uh, change of information from one language to another, whereas a translator turns it into a sensible version of the local language. You're sort of both. You're an interpreter because if the light designer says to you, make it cool blue, you have to make a judgment about what they mean by that because it could be any one of these fine shades of blue or many more. And every single designer will mean a different thing by cool blue. And sometimes they'll mean a different thing depending on which day of the week it is. You have to learn what they want and then deliver that. Um, the hardest part of this job is day one, hour one, when you're sitting with them in the theatre and each of you is trying to work out what the other one knows or doesn't know. And you're trying to work out the words they use and what they mean and how you interpret that. You know, and it might be the simplest thing in the world. It might be when they say, take that light over to the left. Do they mean our left as we're looking at it? Camera left, house left? Or do they mean uh, stage left, which is as the actors are looking at the audience, so is therefore the opposite direction. The first time you do it, you'll get it wrong and they'll say, oh, ooh, I meant stage left. And then you file that away. What this lighting designer means is this, because then you try and remember it from then on. But you're also the translator. I want a sort of magical floating dot thing. I want, you know, I want a backlight. Does that mean a backlight from straight behind me? Or does it mean a backlight from way off to one side? Um, there's a very famous Broadway light designer who used to use one of several programmers and she told me once she chose the programmer depending on if she thought the show was a sort of symmetrical backlight American style show or a diagonal backlight sort of European drama and she chose the programmer more used to working in that idiom to do that show. Um, I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, this is Billy Elliot in various forms. So what you see on stage, what you see on the lighting desk, what you see on the cue sheet, and now what you see in a 3D model, which is a, a, a useful way of sort of maybe getting ahead on the lighting or maybe just being able to work on the lighting more efficiently in the theater. But it's idea to console to lights to stage. So that's the job. Um, the practicalities of it is what we're going to talk about for a bit now. Things that that job involves to let you have that relationship with a designer. Um, you know, and we can be, I think we're amongst friends, so we can be very blunt and we can say, part one is get the gig. Um, and 
that's a whole other talk. And I'm not even going to get into that now, but I am going to say in a blatant bit of promotion um, that I noticed that there's another panel tomorrow uh, with Ethan and another one, I think next week with Benny, where it looks like they're talking about exactly that. So maybe you should come in, tune in for those and you can learn all they need and all they can tell you. I might tune in to find out how we do that in this pandemic times when there's not much work actually going on, because that'll be interesting too. Second thing, just to say, because it has to be said, is then once you've got the gig, then you have to get paid for it. It's As the cliche says, it's called show business and not show fun. Um, and we're actually here to earn a living. Um, and it should be a reasonable living, given that very often we're working very hard and for quite long hours, uh, often in quite high pressure situations. Um, and also keeping in mind that increasingly some of that work happens before you turn up in the venue. Um, so don't be shy. And I think slightly politically, just be careful now that you don't let the rate get talked down because everyone says, oh, we've had tough times, we're in a pandemic. That passed. What you then move into is information gathering. I need to start assimilating as much information as I can about the rig, and what it's going to do and how the light zone is going to do it. And, you know, making sure that I can actually open the files and read them and you know, don't wait until the last minute to try and open the lighting plan and then discover it's in some weird file format you've never heard of, because it's then A, problematic that you come and look to the drawing, and B, embarrassing when you then have to call the designer and admit that you haven't looked at it in the three weeks since they sent it to you, because it's only now you've discovered you can't open it. Um, this is Tree of Codes, the dance show I was talking about earlier. Make sure you can get all the information. You know, is the electrician using a tool like Lightrite, which is a standard? But if so, can you open it? Is it the right version? How are they presenting the information about which gobos and colors and all of those things are in the lights? Because the programmer is sort of the epicenter of everything. You know, they need to know everything in order to set the desk up properly, to then control the lights properly, all of which is in pursuit of that moment when the designer says, can you just do this? And you have to ideally immediately, or if not as quickly as possible, to deliver that. Find out about the show. I mean, it sounds really obvious, but it's very easy to get bedded down in the sort of minutiae of the rig. What's more interesting is, what's the set look like? You know, what's the designer thinking? What, do the, what does their model tell you? What do their sketches tell you? The really good programmers, I think, um, have half or more of a designer brain you know where they're most useful is if they can start to see the way you could like this rather than just reacting to the what the designer later tells them you know as soon as you look at this model which is um, man of the mantra at the london coliseum last year you start to go well there's these translucent panels we're going to have to do something with those there's some kind of big psych thing at the back we're gonna have to do something from those it's going to be really tricky to get light into it you know we need to start thinking about strategies and tricks for dealing with that um, all information is useful. You need to start the conversations with everybody because again, at the epicenter, you're between the designer and the electrician and maybe an assistant or an associate or all the other people involved with the show. You know, at the simplest level, who's doing what? You know, if the lights need channel numbers, who's giving them channel numbers? Um, it's interesting again, in the olden days, so this is Les Mis circa 1985 on the left and maybe 2002 on the right. And in the olden days, the channel numbers used to go right to left. Um, and now they go left to right, which is more sensible, but it took a long time to get to that. But if you work with a lighting designer who prefers to do it the other way around, heaven help you if you try and change it. Do you need channel numbers at all? This is the Vista, which did away with them for a while, um, which is a brilliant concept that turns out doesn't work very well in practice because they're a very really good shorthand for dealing with rights. Who's doing what? Who's deciding all the modes and all the settings and all the everything else that are now involved with these lights? Because you know this is one light, this is the luster LED light and if you don't get all those settings the way you want them to be you won't get the light you want coming out the front of it. Um, and it's much easier to do that in advance than to be crawling around in a truss afterwards. Um, I forgot to write this down, but I'll say it right now. My top tip to you is, in fact, as a programmer, is if something's ever not working, be really sure that it's not something you've done before you send somebody up a truss. Because if they get up the truss and it turns out to be your fault, you're going to be in the bad books for a really long way around, really long time. Uh, 
which way around do the lights hang? Again, that's critical, particularly if you've done the show before or if you've modeled it in, a, in WYSIWYG or one of the sort of pre-visualization packages. You become a proofreader, you know, you become the first person outside of the designer and maybe the electrician to look over the plan and people do make mistakes. Um, you could just ignore them, but then you'll just end up having to fix them later. But if you see something that looks wrong, then you just need to pick up the phone and say, hey, I've seen this and it's a bit strange. And, um, you know, is that right? And sometimes it will be right. Um, Ken Billington, who's an amazing Broadway light designer, does a really interesting thing where he'll have one set of lights from the front of house paired together onto one dimmer with two different colours in them. And every single time I see that on a plan, I assume it's a mistake. And every single time I call him and he goes, no, but at least we've checked in advance rather than in the theatre. It's only after doing all of that that you can actually sit down and start to go, right, now I can start to make the thing I need to make to control the show. I can start pulling together the stuff that I've had from other shows because the obvious key to being a uh, a good programmer is you very rarely, if ever, start from scratch on a show. You're always, it's like eco-friendliness, isn't it? You're always recycling from somewhere else. I've used this before, I've used these lights before, I'll bring these colours in, I'll, I know this works like this, I've made this fixture. and starting to compile it all together into one show file. You're looking for clues wherever you can, and it's really interesting that the clues we get are now changing. Um, this is a list of colours in a colour scroller. If anybody remembers colour scrollers, they're like a thing we used to have before LEDs. Um, but as the programmer, that used to give you a clue of what the lighting designer was thinking about the colour palette of the show. And the first thing I used to do on a show is get that list and make sure I'd made all of those colours in all the moving lights so that I had that colour palette available for every kind of light. Um, we don't have scrollers now, so now you don't get those clues. So what that relies on is having the conversation again. And actually what it makes in the theatre is it, it makes the process of picking colour get delayed. And now what you're doing is working with the designer and trying to mix colour live in front of everybody else. And that's hard because the language of colour is really hard. You know, what do we mean by greeny blue? What do we mean by deep blue? It's different for everybody. Um, I have a suspicion that at some point Lee and Roscoe will reinvent their free swatch book as a sort of very expensive paid swatch book, a bit like the Pantone system they use in printing. And that will become our sort of standard colour reference or colour language and way of calibrating between lights. Um, but they haven't done it yet. Uh, watch out for complications. You know, lights used to just fade up and down, then they move, then they change colour. Now, you know, you very quickly run into these situations with giant video walls and giant LED arrays where you end up with thousands of things and you have to figure out sensible ways of controlling with them. Um, and that's just a trick and just practice. But again, the time to start thinking about it isn't the day you show up in the venue. Um, because it might not just be an obvious array. This is Man of La Mancha again with this enormous curved cyclorama. Um, these are Robert Juliet Dali fixtures, but they're all individual cell control so that we can do graduated cycloramas or sunrises or sunsets, all of which is basically pixel control on what we would have thought of as a normal cyclorama, you know, five years ago. Um, it might just be these lines and lines and lines of linear light that we now get. You know, it's, it's amusing to me that we now sort of buy light by the foot. You know, I'll have 300 meters of X4s or I have 500 meters of LED tape. This is 70 meters of, um, sorry, not a Martin product, GLP X4s, but there are lots of other Martin lights in the rig on this show. Um, but that's a 70 meter run of them across the front of a show I'm doing in Thailand, which we had to figure out how to deal with. Most importantly, when you talk to the designer and you must talk to the designer, just listen to what they say, you know, and just, don't assume you know what they're going to say. Just listen and listen for clues and listen for the language they use and listen for the descriptions and just let it all soak in um, because that will inform the work that you then get to do later on with them. Having compiled everything, now you can actually make the show file. Um, 
and everybody does this in a different way. There are no rights, there are no wrongs. Brad, for example, has written forever about ways of doing this and you should read all of his work because actually it's all really interesting. Um, but taking the plan into a format where you have efficient control of the rig in whatever lighting console you choose to use. Um, if you're lucky, you'll get to choose the lighting console you want to use. Um, if you're not, you I'd better go practice it because again, it's nothing like looking foolish in front of a lighting designer on day one of technical rehearsal uh, to put you in your place. Um, it's a really interesting, intimate relationship uh, that you, what you find is people who are really good use one lighting desk or maybe at most they use two, um, but it's because it's another example of this translation process. Um, and it's, What's important is that it becomes like the difference between um, sort of speaking French stumblingly, you know, thinking of what you're trying to say in English or your native language, and then your brain translates it word by word into French, and then those words come out of your mouth really stutteringly, and all the French people look at you as if you're a bit crazy. Um, and being fluent in a language, is, which is when you think in that language and it comes out naturally in that language and it becomes conversational and you stop translating. The best programmers are fluent in their lighting desks. They've stopped thinking about what they're actually doing. It just happens somewhere between their brain and their hands and the rest of their brain is left free to listen to the lighting designer and look at the stage. And those are the two most important things. Everything else is just a conduit to deliver that to the stage. Um, you need to build it in a way that lets you work quickly and is familiar to you. And this is a thing that I call cockpit drill, um, which again is from pilots. Pilots train and train and train and train and train and train in simulators and everything else. So that on the most boring flight, they do nothing. But the moment something is out of the ordinary or is going wrong, they don't have to think about what they're doing. They can just get in and do it and hopefully not crash. Um, the lighting desk should be the same. You know, you shouldn't have to think about where things are and it should be laid out in a way that if you make a mistake, it's obvious to you that you've made a mistake. Um, the confession, here's a confession. So Billy Elliott in Japan, we were talking about, um, watching the YouTube videos, there was a moment where you were, there's a, a square of light that chases around Billy at the end of Act One. And we kept seeing it move into position as it was fading up, which is not really something we normally do in Billy Elliot. And I was like, this is strange because I don't remember that. Um, but so maybe the timing of the show has changed, except that bit's on a, like a click track. So I don't think that's it. Maybe somebody's calling the queue late. Maybe somebody's messed up the programming. Maybe it's just possible that we're, the camera is upstairs and we have only ever sat downstairs and we just never noticed. And I went and looked in the show file from when we did the show there three years ago uh, and discovered that it was doing what the show file told it to do. So it wasn't an accident. But because I could see I hadn't programmed it the way I would expect to have programmed it, it was a mistake that we just never noticed, which is really embarrassing. Um, so we fixed that and the show looks fine again, but that's because I knew how I would have done that and it wasn't done like that. Again, what the cues look like, what the channels look like, how you name colours, how you name positions, everything about it is just giving you feedback on whether everything is working properly. You know, if the light says it's in blue on the screen and it's red on the stage, something has gone wrong, whether that's the light's broken or your programming is messed up, but you need to fix it. Whereas if it just said, Cyan 48, Magenta 97, whatever, you wouldn't necessarily know what it was supposed to be doing. How do you want to see that information? And on distributed systems, how other people want to see that information? Do you and the line designer, are you old school? Do you want to see this? It's like the hundred channel array, the oldest way of looking at lighting information in history. Do you want this, which is the magic sheet? But if you do, somebody's got to go make it and that's more pre-production time. And is it worth doing that? will you get a return from the investment on doing that work? Um, do they want a sort of 3D rendered, visualized view, whatever? This is the one built into the EOS now on this big show in Thailand. Um, some people prefer that, some people don't. Make everything you think you might need. Make all the colors you have and then add some more. Um, make the ones the lighting designers talked about. And even if you don't know what those colors are yet, in terms of the actual look, 
make the palette and then label it because it's quicker to do that in advance and then just fill in the numbers later than to be recording and labeling and all of that stuff as you go along. Again, find out what the light designer already knows. Do they have in their head an idea of where all the cues are going to be and what the cues are going to do, what the times are? Do they have labels for them? And if so, start getting that into the machine because then it's there ready, waiting for you to come and fill it in with lights later on. Um, some line designers now will put that information straight into the offline editor software directly. That becomes their working tool for the cue sheet. In which case you need to figure out how to grab that and get it into your show file. Time code, are you doing a time code show? Can you start getting all of those points in in advance? You know, we always work in a really high pressure environment, particularly once we get into the venue. Anything you can do in advance uh, is gonna help you. And ultimately your job is to help the lighting designer. And so it will help them as well and will help the show as a whole. Um, At some point you have to sort of give up this show file. You have to go, oh, I've done as much as I can do. I'm gonna send this precious thing to the theater or to the electrician because very often they will be in the venue before you are setting stuff up. Um, sort of, you need to have done a little mental checklist before you do that because once it leaves your hands and it's out in the wild, it's very hard to get control of it again because now lots of different people can be making lots of different changes at the same time. So you just need to do a little mental checklist to yourself. Have I really done everything that I absolutely really can do in advance? And then with your blessing by the magic of email, let it go. Um, you won't see it again until either you're somewhere with the designer doing pre-visualization work, if you're doing that, or until you turn up in the theater uh, or the other venue. It might not be a theater in this day and age. It might be a hotel lobby. Um, this is the Wynn Macau. It might be not a venue at all. It might be the rooftop of some crazy building um, with a hole in the middle, apparently. Um, because lighting now doesn't just mean lighting for shows. Lighting means lighting for anything that could be lit. And again, that's what's interesting about the work we all do is the range of it. But in terms of the interface from designer to machine to lights, it's the same process and it's the same setup and it's the same being prepared to do everything you can as quickly as possible. There's nothing different about it until you actually arrive in the place and have to sort of move in and set up home. You know, because if you're setting up home on a roof where you might need to worry about rain and wind and weather and mosquitoes and all kinds of other misery, it's not the same as setting up home in a nice theatre, which is my world normally, with a roof and usually some kind of heating, not always. Um, but when you get there, you need to start deciding where you want to be and then sort of fighting for your world. Because again, particularly on a big show or a big musical, this is gonna be your home for the next week or the next month or on some of those Cirque shows, like the next year. You know, you want to not be perched on a wobbly wooden board resting on the back of a seat because eventually you're gonna fall off or you're gonna really hurt your back. Um, Again, it sounds like I'm an old man, but I've been doing this for a long time and sometimes my back hurts. So you sort of need to fight for a decent working environment, but also one that puts you in a place where you can see what you're trying to do on stage. Um, but also that's a collaboration with the designer. That's another conversation because sometimes they will want you to not block the route that the director and others use to get to them. So you will sit behind them. Sometimes, and this is not often a good sign about the show, they will want you to block the path for the director and the designer so they can't get to them. So you become like the blocker, um, which is interesting. Sometimes, very often with American designers, they want you to sit upstairs so that you can be in charge of seeing what's happening on the floor. Um, again, Hamilton, if you've seen it, see it twice. See it from downstairs, which is one show, and then see it from upstairs where you see all this stuff that's happening on the floor which is a whole other different lighting story that the downstairs audience are completely unaware of. Um, but you need to set up your home. Uh, you need to set up all the technology, who needs what, who needs to connect what, who needs a printer, who needs the internet. You need to find out the password for the internet. It's the first thing you need, well, it's the second thing you need to do. The first thing is to make sure you know where the toilets are, because that's quite important. Um, this was the setup for Evita in New York. 
make yourself comfortable make sure you've got all the stuff you need make sure the desk works make sure it turns on make sure it's got the right software make sure make sure make sure make sure make sure um, because at the end of the day if it doesn't work uh, you're the one who ends up looking foolish um, set up all your screens and stuff so that you can get to everything and you're not always knocking them off and ideally uh, you can still see the stage um, I used to Grandma 3 the other day and it's quite hard because there's so much screen that there's a little bit of like you need a periscope to see over it. Uh, this is Billy Elliot somewhere in the world. Um, this is a bad example. We don't have a seat. We didn't get to take these seats out. So we're all perching on the edge of the, these seats, which is not comfortable. But we are right in the middle of the auditorium with a really good view of the stage. This is the Giudizia Universale in Italy. Just this, this this massive array of projectors all over the roof. Um, it would be remiss, I think, not to touch on the sort of the new times we live in. You know, the fact that we are all now working in masks and maybe with a test before we get in in the morning, and wiping down our consoles every day and sanitizing and all of this kind of stuff, um, which we're clearly going to have to keep doing for a while. It's really interesting. Masks make my ears hurt. Turns out. Um, and if you wear glasses, you spend all your time dealing with, uh, with them fogging up, which is also hard. But it's a new world and we just have to figure out the tools we need, just like we have with everything else. Don't be dull. Nobody likes dull. You know, we're, we're all there for the fun of it. So anything you can do to sort of make people gravitate to the production desk and think like you're having a good time is useful. And the most powerful tool for doing that is in normal times, disclaimer, is food. Um, you want people to come to the production desk because that's how you find out all the gossip. That's how you really find out what's going on in the show. So how you find out what the director really wants. Having people gravitate to your production desk is a key skill. Um, again, Hal Binkley, who passed away a few weeks ago, the lighting designer, uh, had a really nice tribute written to him by Lin-Manuel Miranda, who's the guy who wrote Hamilton, uh, where basically he was thanking Hal for always making him welcome at his production desk and having a place to go hide in the middle of making a big, complicated, demanding show. That's a role of the light designer and their team as much as anything else, I think, because we have that home in the middle of the theatre. All that done, finally, finally, you get to turn some lights on, you get to take control of everything. Um, and then it's what I call check, check, check again. And again, I don't know why I like all these airline analogies, but I do. But before a plane takes off, you hope that somebody goes around and sort of kicks the tires and looks in the engines and makes sure everything works. And the person who ultimately signs off on that, again, is the pilot. Um, and in this case, that's actually the co-pilot, the programmer. You know, if we get into a lighting session and the light breaks, you know, as a designer, I don't mind that as long as I know that at nine o'clock in that morning, somebody checked and it was working. You know, if it's broken since, that's okay. If it, nobody checks and it wasn't working at nine o'clock in the morning, then that's a problem because it means we've started trying to do our work without the sort of full deck of our tools. You have to check um, and you have to check everything. You have to check every function of every light, every time. Um, you have to check when you're first there that everything's the right way around and moving like you expect it to do. That means you have to know which way you expect the light to move when you turn the encoder, not just be like, well, most of them are the same and that one's different, so that one's wrong. Is it wrong or are all the others wrong? You have to sort of be in charge of your own destiny. Um, and if it's not working properly, again, as this sort of hub in the middle of the lighting production team, you're the one who has to not necessarily go fix it, but you have to coordinate the response to get somebody to go and fix the lights. Um, and as part of that, the, the, you know, particularly on theatre shows, particularly on plays that now have all this technology in them, you have to make sure all the detail is right. You know, you have to make sure that if you expect the multi-cell array to be numbered that way, it is. Because if it's numbered that way, everything's gonna go in the wrong direction when you try and do a chase. You know, if, if you're doing a play and there's the option to have control of the fan speed of fixtures to keep the noise down, you have to do that because otherwise all we're doing is taking away the dynamic range that the actor has to go from 
whisper to a shout by reducing the, the their quietest level. And that's not fair because that's why the stage on a play is there, is for them to communicate with the audience. Finally, finally, after all of that, uh, you get to start work on the show. And you know, this is the bit we've all been working towards. You get to turn off the house lights, turn off the work lights and start making these pretty or dramatic or amazing or scary or whatever pictures on stage. But he, you can already hear the language being used to try and describe uh, the visuals. Um, the thing about this that I love, that sort of just gets overlooked because we don't really think about it, is that every single time we start, we're starting on something different, bespoke, unique, never seen before. Um, and that's sort of the fun of the job and the amazing thing about the job, but also the challenge of the job. Um, because you can't just recycle what you learned before. You have to bring that to the project. You know, you have to say, I know how to do this and I can do this. And I can, I've done that before and I think that works and I can adapt it to this. It's slightly too easy to fall into the habit of going, oh, I tried that before and it just didn't work. Rather than going, maybe this is the show where this chase works or this color works or whatever. So because every show is different and unique, you have to come into it with an open mind, prepared and willing to take all the skills and knowledge that you have or that you've learned on all these other shows um, and to just give all you've got, you know, for the next however long you're in the theater. Um, and that means now suddenly working one-on-one -on -one, and we come back to how we started this relationship with the designer because suddenly it's this most unique, special, intimate relationship because almost you're inside their head, particularly when you're all wearing headsets and you're all talking really quietly and the sound is going straight into your ear and straight into your brain. It's like a kind of communication you don't really get with anybody else. Um, and then with the others in the team making the show because you're, you, the lighting again becomes very often the hub between others in the auditorium who don't have comms and the stage managers and other people backstage who do very often everything gets rooted through lighting um, so now you have to start learning about how the light designer thinks you have to start learning the words they use um, you have to start learning what they want to talk about in between cues you have to start learning if they want you to make a suggestion or they want you to shut up and some it depends you know it varies depending on how much of a struggle they're having with the show you have to be able to sort of get a sense of what they need from you and then deliver that. Um, you know, you have to know when it's time to say, maybe we should just stop and have a cup of coffee. You have to know that if they just want to keep going and not have a break, then you have to be there with them because they're just sort of in the moment. Um, you have to think of some good places to go for dinner because at some point that's the best way of escaping and going and having a chance to turn your head off from all of this stuff that you've been so intensely focused on for so many hours a day. Um, and that's all a big learning curve. And it's sort of, you learn it every single day that you do it. And then you start all over again with a different designer. But the reason that you see teams of designers and programmers, the reason that a designer will get a programmer back is because if you've done all the work of establishing that relationship and learning that language and understanding the words they mean, and getting on with them and having fun at dinner and having fun in the bar afterwards and having a good time, not being miserable um, and doing your job really well and hopefully delivering a beautiful result at the end. Uh, they will want to work with you again because that's easier than going through all of that learning curve all over again with somebody new. Um, that's why those teams exist, form and reform. And what you also have to do is keep your ears open all the time. Again, Ken Billington calls this reading the room. Listen to everything. Listen to everything that's going on around you. You know, if, the, if your designer is having a conversation with the director, listen in. Because even if you can get some hints from that, if you hear somebody say, well, maybe this should be a bit more red, don't necessarily put it on stage because the designer might not want to sort of give away their hand but you can start to get the stuff ready so that when they then turn to you and say, right, now we're gonna try this, you're ready to do it. 
the trick of looking like a super fast programmer is to have listened and have stuff ready to go. Because even if it's not quite right, it's a starting point that you can then adjust. Listen to the gossip that's going on. Listen to, just listen to everything. Everything is a clue as to something that's about to happen on stage. Uh, and everything that happens on stage will ultimately affect the work you're doing as a programmer because you're the one dealing with making it visible. You know, a, a little muttering about that, no, oh, maybe that actor, needs, that singer needs to be over on the other side of the stage. You're going to have to start getting ready to move lights and adapt palettes, and you can just start thinking about that. Literally every single thing is a clue um, to pay attention to. And then just keep working. And as you work and work and work and work and work and work, you will make a beautiful show. Um, somewhere along the way, just mentioned in passing, you need to write this a long running show or a show that's going to have a life. You need to write it all down, document it in some way so that you can then hand it over to somebody else. Is that your job? Is it the associate designer's job? Is it the programmer's job? It's sort of everybody's job and you all need to work as a team because in a year's time, when you come back to the show, you will thank your year ago self for the work that you've done when you can't remember the show and all the information is there waiting for you. Um, the most important thing, I think, is just to keep looking up. You know, the, the danger of being the person in charge of the machine. Now, I don't want to call them a technician because I, that word has the wrong connotation for what we do. But the danger is you can be head down in the machine, hammering, hammering, hammering away. Um, look up, you know, the amazing special part of what we do is the thing that's happening on stage. And if what really interests you is the hammering away and the numbers and the buttons and all of that, then, you know, with all due respect, maybe you should go work for Google or a bank or somewhere that will pay you a lot more money, give you a pension and let you go on holiday every now and again. Um, the interesting part of what we do is what happens on stage. Uh, this picture is Tree of Codes. That's one dancer in light with no Photoshop. So I'll leave it up to you to figure out how we did that. Um, programmer thing, save often and to many different places. If you mess up, you want to be able to get back to a version of the show that's right. And if you really mess up, you don't want to be the one sitting there saying to this lighting designer you've established this relationship with, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up. You need to know that you can get back to the previous version of the show. Um, I guess the last thought or a thought to end on maybe or to lead into questions is, and this really is sort of at the heart of this relationship and how it evolves over time. Uh, it can become very easy as the programmer particularly when you're there really late at night, like this was a three in the morning lighting session we were doing, um, particularly when you've been hammering away at all these keys through every break and the lighting designer has been sitting there sort of reading their newspaper and drinking coffee and gossiping with the director. It can be really easy to convince yourself that you are the hardest working person in the room, that you're working harder than anybody else, that you should be getting infinitely more reward and infinitely more credit, infinitely more thanks and infinitely more everything else. Um, the thing you have to remember is you're not. In the lighting team, it's the lighting designer that has their name on the poster. I mean, it's also, that's why they get the royalties and the big fees and all the rest of it. But what that really means is the buck stops with them. You know, if the director hates everything about the show, they'll come and yell at them, not you. If the producer flips out and decides that everything needs to be the other way up and bright pink, they'll come and yell at them and not you. You're in this incredibly privileged, fascinating, fun position of sort of being an observer to all of this without some of the responsibility um, to watch and to learn and to be part of and to contribute. But ultimately, the buck doesn't stop with you. And also, the hardest part of any of these jobs isn't the hammering away at the buttons and the keys and it's coming up with the ideas in the first place. And for the most part, that's what the lighting zone is doing. So even when it looks like they're sitting there in the old days smoking a cigarette, but now and drinking whiskey, but not really allowed to do that so much anymore, or maybe you can't tell because they can do it behind a mask. Um, even when it looks like they're not paying attention and they're focused somewhere else and they're talking, what they're doing is thinking of the next idea. And that is the hardest job. 
And if you become convinced that the ideas you're having are better than the ideas having, or you become convinced that somehow they're doing stuff that you should be doing, or you're doing stuff that maybe you think they should be doing, that's probably time to start thinking about change of job and maybe say to yourself, actually, I've done this now, I've done this really well, but actually maybe I'd like to try the, a different step or the next step. And I'd like to try to be the one who has those ideas. Um, and then maybe it's time to start thinking of a different career, moving into a career of life and design and maybe combining both. And I have to say that's sort of what I've done now, had done pre-coronavirus. Um, and the thing I'll leave to end with, just to think about the difference between those two things is, part of the reason I made that change is because I programmed a number of really big shows with the same designers who I got on with really well, but where I came out at the end of every day, sort of brain dead exhausted because I could do everything I needed to do sort of on autopilot. You know, I knew how to do it. I knew how to work the desk. I sort of expected the ideas they were gonna have and I could deliver those quite efficiently. But the result was my brain wasn't really working at full capacity and I just came out like tired, tired, like dog tired, particularly by the end of a long technical period. Um, and then at some point I lit a show, which was a musical called Daddy Cool, which wasn't very good, but that doesn't really matter. And also when you're involved in these shows, you can't let yourself think they're not very good. You come out convinced that they're the most amazing thing because that's how you've got yourself through the process of making them. And it was an incredibly hard, complicated show. But what I remember is coming out of the theatre every night, sort of elated, tired, because my brain was still working overtime, trying to solve all the different problems that we were going to have to figure out how to deal with the next day. And it was like buzzy tired. It was like high tired. Um, and I just sort of decided I preferred that, I think. And that's why I've tried to be a light designer or be a light designer who also programs rather than just being a programmer. Of course, your mileage may completely vary, but just keep that in mind and while you're working just sort of engage in this process of self-analysis you know as well as doing the job think about how you're doing the job how you could do the job better but also about sort of what you're getting out of the job I guess um, and that can help inform either if you love that job of programming how to do it better if you want to change to be a designer how to do that better if you realize what you're interested in is making consoles better, go work for manufacturing, and you can do that there. But the self-analysis um, will fuel your next decisions as you move on to some other things in the industry, I think. Okay, that's probably enough waffling on from me. Um, I'll just say that I've put at the bottom the We Make Events Happen uh, website because what is really important right now when a lot of people aren't working is everybody sort of sticking together to fight the fight to get our industry in whatever country you're in uh, the recognition and ideally government support it deserves. We make events are doing a pretty good job of doing that in the UK and in America and in other places. So go visit, sign up. Next time we all get to light our houses red, make sure you do that. Next time we all get to go stand outside Parliament with a red t-shirt on, make sure you do that as well. Because all those actions are helping um, governments who've never really quite figured out or realised how big our industry is now, which is understandable because we haven't done a very good job of figuring out how big it is understand how big we are and how good we are normally and how much help we need now not because we failed in any way but because we need to survive so that we get to do it all again so go have a look at that anyway thank you for all of that probably i should say any questions and we should figure out how people can ask questions so we do have some questions that were sent in um okay. the first one messy desktop. Now. <laughs> the first one is asking, what console in your history were you most excited about getting your hands on? Uh, uh, that, that, I think there's a big can of worms answering that. Um, I think there's a whole generation of us who grew up with lighting consoles and we started on one and we grew up with it. You know, so I grew up with Strand 500 series desk. And I did a lot of shows on it. I got very involved with um, helping them make it better. So a lot of what was in that console was me. And I suspect Brad probably did the same thing with the Hog 2. Um, and, you know, there were early grandma people who did the same thing with the MA. And there were early people with the EOS who did the same thing with that. And that's the most exciting process. Um, there's a really interesting thing somebody said to me a while ago now, but 
the first time I did a show, having used the Strand S for 10 years, the first time I did a show on the MA1 console, uh, it was a bit of a disaster. And so the second time we used it, which we had to do because it, it was then the only desk that could control enough uh, DMX universes. We needed 36 universes of DMX. Only MA could do it at that point. And so they sent their sort of superstar uh, grandma programmer, who's called Marcus Cromer, to sit behind me, like here, and be the sort of, you know, that really annoying um, Microsoft paperclip in Word? You know, hey, I see you're trying to write a letter. How can I help you? Marcus was like that. And he knew when to say, have you ever thought of doing this? And he knew when to say, no, oh, don't do that. And he knew just when to sit quietly. But what he said was really interesting is he said, you know, a couple of weeks in, he said, oh, you're sort of getting the hang of this now. Um, yeah, I don't think I could do what you're doing. And I said, well, what do you mean? You know, you could do everything I'm doing. You know, this desk far better than me. Uh, and he said, yeah, but I started on the MA when it could do nothing, like day one, beta version one. And I've learned each new thing as it got added over time, um, figured out, suggested some of them, but I've learned it incrementally until today when I know all of it. He said, whereas what you've done is you've sort of got thrown into the deep end of this incredibly wide, incredibly deep lighting console, and you're trying to learn all of it at the same time, and that's hard. And so I think, you know, on the one hand, I think, you know, your favorite desk is like your first love. You'll always have a special sweet spot for it. But I think now it's really hard because all these consoles are so advanced that we're always sort of, you know, everything's been put into it for a reason. But when you come to it new, you're sort of running to catch up with what it can do. Um, and that is, it, it's hard, but it also means you, you don't, I've never quite felt as comfortable with another light and death since because I wasn't involved in making it, I guess. So there you go, that's the non-answer answer. answer. All right, next question is asking, what do you think the next big leap forward will be for lighting control? Uh, the stick it in your brain thing. Um, I think the interesting new frontier at the moment is color. You know, color we've always assumed is easy because, you know, traditionally you've gone, I want this shade, I want Roscoe 68, which is like a bluey green color. So I cut out that piece of gel and I stick it in front of the light and that's the color I get. And a lot of light designers don't really understand the science of how that color works. They just know that it looks pretty on that costume. And at the end of the day, that's how actually all that matters. Um, moving lights made that complicated because now you're mixing color. Uh, LEDs make that more complicated because now you're mixing color with lots of color. Um, and the hardest part is that as the conventional light with the gel has gone away, our sort of frame of reference has gone away. So if I said Roscoe 68, everybody would either of a certain age know what I was talking about, or they could go get a swatch book and go, oh, it's that color, okay, make that. As soon as you can't do that, it becomes really hard because as an extreme, um, if you light a show in venue one and it's got somebody's model of um, LED spotlight and you mix a load of colors and they're really precise and the light designer loves them, and then you transfer that show to another venue and it's got company, you know, it's got Martin, the Martin profiles instead of the ETC profiles. The numbers don't make the same color, but now you don't have a reference. So how do you make that same color again? Um, and if that color is really critically important, then that is a big issue. Um, I think, so I think the work ETC have done in their consoles about managing color, particularly with their fixtures is great. I think what the next step is when we can get all the manufacturers into that game so that I can pick anybody's light on my console and say, I want this color and I get the same color out of all of them. Um, to me, that would be an absolute game changer, but that there's a sort of level of cooperation in that, that traditionally we haven't had, but maybe we all just need to encourage a bit. So I think color is the hard one. All right, next question. Do you feel that the knowledge and experience of the past is being carried forward or is the advancement of technology driving the future of lighting? Uh, I suspect whoever asked that knows that I'm a sucker for a bit of old technology. Um, uh, so I run this, I help run this thing called Backstage Heritage Collection in the UK. Um, and you'll find a website somewhere if you go look for it. And it's a sort of attempt to, well, on the one hand, physically rescue old stuff and put it somewhere safe. And then to sort of get all the information about that old stuff and get it online. So it's a sort of virtual slash real museum 
thing. You know, in an ideal world, we'd like a real museum with a real building, but that's probably never going to happen. Um, and what's been interesting coming out of that is we've sort of amassed this mailing list of all the people who invented all the products that you used at any time in the last, I don't know, 40 years. So what's amazing now, if I have a question about something, I can say, hey, tell me about product X and throw it out to the group. And you get all these amazing answers back. And what's really interesting is how very often, you know, there's an answer which is an explanation of something that was done 30 years ago that sort of got lost along the way that is now just sort of bubbling up and coming back to the surface. And the thing I find interesting is why things get lost along the way. You know, so the light board, which is the strand console that we looked at at the National Theatre, um, with those what they call group masters. So what you could do is you could say, right, uh, you had to use channel numbers because it was, you know, back in the day. But effectively, you could say, I want the, the cross light on this wheel. I want the back light on this wheel. I want the psych group on this wheel. And I want the front light on this wheel. And you could balance the lighting. But the key thing was when you recorded that cue, uh, what was on those wheels got remembered. So when you came back to edit that cue next, it all magically appeared again. And you didn't have to faff around figuring out which lights were on again with you know, magic sheets and plans and paperwork. You could just go, oh, okay, the backlight's too bright. <laughs> Turn it down a bit. And we've lost that. Um, and I don't know, I think the only reason I can think we lost it is because the National Theatre moved overnight from the old Vic where they had a hundred dimmers to the new National Theatre where they had 800 dimmers plus moving lights, scroll, um, colour changes, semaphore colour changes, everything else. And they had to have tools to deal with that. Whereas everybody else has gone, uh, you know, we've got 50 dimmers and now we've got 70 and now we've got 100 and now we've added some scrollers and now we've added some moving lights. And they've sort of figured out the, the, the cheats they need to do along the way to deal with that. It seems to me that it's very rare for us collectively to take a step back and sort of actually reassess and say how can I actually do my job better and to me that means the machine having a better understanding of what you're trying to do you as the programmer and you as the lighting designer and give you better tools to help with that you know and so things like a magic sheet I don't think is that because it's just the same information presented in a different way and the visualizer is really clever but it's not that because it's the same information presented in a different way what you want is the machine to understand that even though your queue looks like it's made up of 500 different channels, it's actually this block of channels, which is the backlight, and this block is the front light, and this is the side light, and that's how you're thinking of them and manipulating them. And nobody really does that. So, you know, I hope history will inform uh, some of that back into future products. And I also hope the sort of ability to step back and look back and reassess will come into some of those products. Plus the old stuff's just really cool to look at because it's all enormous. All right, next question is asking, how are you sanitizing your consoles? Uh, um, well, part one is, again, confession time, because I mainly do theater and theater's mainly been shut down. I haven't done very much hanging out with consoles lately. Um, but I have been hanging out with students with consoles and what we're doing with them is like disinfection wipes on the keyboard every day and on the screens. We're making sure that they do it at the end. Whoever's using it at the end of the day does it at the end and whoever does it at the beginning of the day does it at the beginning so that if somebody forgets you're sort of covered either way. Um, these poor lighting desks are like the cleanest they've ever been. You know they're like why am I, why am I so shiny? I've never been this shiny before. Um, you know wearing masks all the time on the bigger shows, I know what they're doing is it's a new use of this sort of ability to network consoles together, which is you say, this is my console as the head programmer and only I'm allowed to touch it. And if the electrician needs to sort of get in and do something, instead of just barging in, they will have um, a second console set up that only they're allowed to use. So you're controlling who is physically touching any console at any point in time. And also on this couple of shows that have happened, we haven't ended up with the designer and the programmer snuggled up next to each other. We've made sure that they're much further apart width-wise or sort of front to back. Um, but it is interesting because again, you know, there's been a couple of shows where they have tested, they've done a rapid test on everybody going into the production. And, and if you trust the test, which is a different discussion, you know that nobody in that room has it. So then you sort of go, surely we can relax some of this stuff. 
but nobody does rightly because we're all sort of going for this belts and braces every possible eventuality approach um, and i think that's right and it's not just the consoles you know comms is a big thing you know you don't want if somebody else has had a microphone here all day you don't want that so now everyone's been much more careful about this is your one with your name on it and you take it with you um and things like that and and probably they should carry on because at the end of the day even if we figure out a solution to this maybe it means we'll just get less colds going forwards but i think really it's common sense you know it's there's nothing magical about it it's just common sense applied in a way that we've never had to do before okay who's next all right next question do you have a standard checklist or do you modify for the type of show um I, I i keep thinking you know it's interesting that i keep thinking i should write it down because again the pilots even though they've done this job for 30 years have a real printed checklist that they work through every time just to make sure they don't miss anything i keep thinking i should do that but then i never quite do and so you know the check the show file thing is the number of times that i've literally been hovering over the send button and the email and then gone oh i've forgotten to do something and sort of stopped myself and gone and fixed it so it's sort of a mental thing, but I think, you know, again, without knocking the pilots and their checklists, some of it just becomes mental habit. It's just the mental checklist that you run through every time. Um, I don't think it's necessarily different for different kinds of shows, uh, because I think that there's a lot of commonality to what we do, regardless of what the kind of show is. I mean, there are different things you have to make. So like, you know, I've just done some work on a film and they were very keen that they had um, a set of colour palettes that were graduated CTOs measured with a light meter. You wouldn't normally do that in a theatre, but it's the same part of the checklist of what does the light designer want and what do I need to prepare in advance for them. And it's just then another thing that you have to do. So yes and no, is that a good answer? <laughs> okay, next question is asking, what is one of your most memorable shows? Uh, well, See, so you have to qualify that because, of course, there's memorable, the show is amazing, and then there's memorable because the show was completely the opposite of amazing. Because, you know, some of the most memorable shows are the shows which are complete, total, utter disasters. So, if we just do both of them quickly, Daddy Cool, which is the show I mentioned, which was a, the first time I got to be the line designer on a big West End musical, but produced by this crazy, crazy producer who took what the concept of the show had been and decided to bolt this sort of 15 minute carnival section onto the end. And to do that, he went to Italy and had these people who make giant carnival animals make a sort of 30 foot wingspan parrot, which they then hang up of, above the theater and it flaps in flying, which ultimately pulled the roof of the theater down. And then he made, the thing I mainly remember is he made this giant snake with these giant fangs, which protruded through the stomach of the sun god Ra. Um, and was operated by like two guys at the back counterbalancing it and they let go and so this snake crashed into the ground broke its tooth off and this has never happened before or since but I, I i couldn't stop laughing like proper hysterical laughter and that's when you needed a programmer because i had to say i have to leave i have to literally go stand in the back of the theater to stop laughing but you just need to carry on running the cues um but you know that sort of summed up the whole show the good show is tree of codes which is this one that the one at the end that you saw on the last slide and the, the three colored girls um which i lit and programmed but that was amazing because it was everything a show is meant to be in terms of how you collaborate to make a show you know it was everybody had conversations everybody chipped in ideas nobody was afraid to say something how stupid you know regardless of how stupid it might sound and when you did somebody else would say how about if we do this but then do this um, amazing people um, and the time in the theatre when we made the show was like this super intense lock-in because um, Oliver Lyson, the visual artist who designed the set, we only had for two days. So we had two days where we had to sort of figure out how we were actually going to do the show. And it was, again, just amazing because you could, and again, I think this was the advantage of being the programmer slash designer is it was very quick just to try an idea and know that if people didn't like it, there was no sort of penalty to that. You could just throw it away and try a different idea really quickly. And the show looks amazing, I think. Uh, the show is one of the most intense audience experiences I've seen. Um, it's not really a very complicated show, but it requires an incredible amount of attention to detail, which is very pleasing when you get it right. 
but mainly it's just like you know I've seen this show lots of times now and there are moments when I still watch it and kind of go you know I made that I made that and I'm just really pleased with it proud of it whatever and that's the sort of reward you get for all the other shows where that doesn't happen so I think probably Truth Codes is my favorite all right um, next question is from Ben Payne um do you prefer programming with the technical lighting designer those who can drive a lighting desk or those who aren't technically based no, the, the one the this is where you want to know who's watching um before you answer this uh the the I have to say the technical ones drive me slightly crazy um, and there are becoming more of them because lots of the, like the younger generation designers have grown up having to run the lighting desk themselves on little shows uh, not necessarily by choice but because of finance and time and money and all of that kind of and, and staffing um, and, and they sort of, when they move for a bigger show, it feels like sometimes they've begrudgingly accepted the programmer for all the reasons I talked about, but they still think that maybe it would all just be going faster if they could do it themselves. You know, and it's really interesting because there's, I'm not going to name names, but there is one who, you know, I think I'm a pretty reasonable speed and I'm sitting there doing things at what I think is a pretty reasonable speed. And he's sitting there going, come on, come on, come on, come on. And it's like, Okay, just so you know, you saying come on every three seconds is not actually going to make me go any faster. But I think that's because when he's working the desk, he always thinks he's working faster. I'm not sure he actually is, but because he's doing something, whereas now he's waiting, he thinks it's all going slowly. Um, you know, and that's just it's a, it's a sort of mindset adaptation on both parts. You know, I, I spent a long time working with David Hersey, who is very much not of that school and is very much of the school of we need a sort of thing like this over there and maybe these channels. And that's interesting because you become much more involved in the process of making the show and you feel much less like a sort of glorified typist. Um, so I'll happily do either because, you know, at the end of the day, we've all got bills to pay. Um, but yeah, the, the, the non-technical ones are more fun. Now, of course, when I put my light design hat on, I'm completely aware that I can be the worst kind of technical writing designer. And I apologise to everybody who's ever had to sit on the other end but sorry. Anyway. All right, next question. Do you believe that newer designers, programmers need to go learn the basics? Um, for example, not use WYG for everything, make a chase with your fingers on buttons. Uh, I mean, yes, I, you know, I think I grew up on manual boards. So I grew up on a two preset 24 channel manual fader board. And then I graduated to a three preset 60 channel manual fader board. You know, I'm not saying we should all have to do that because equally we shouldn't all go drive horses and carts. You know, the technology has moved on. But there's something quite wonderful about um, being able to actually play the lights rather than just sort of defining and defining and defining and then pressing go and then redefining. Um, you know, I have a memory. We did a, I, my first two and a half years of sort of professional life. I worked for a touring theatre company. Um, and we toured a, the memory boards which had the show in it and we plugged it into the local dimmers and you know we did our show we toured our rig uh and you know and again this is a bad mission and it, this is where the save 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 things come from but we were in some venue somewhere the next date was in america so our my boss had already gone to america to set up the rig i was running the show and then we were all going to america um, we did two shows, so we changed over. So we were always loading a show back from disc. One show, um, the show started with the safety curtain going out. It got halfway out. All the power in the entire town failed. The safety curtain came back in, show stopped. You know, we all sat in the dark. We waited a bit, came back, we carried on. Now, the next day when we went to load the other show, because the floppy disc had been in the drive and had clearly got some kind of spike, it wouldn't load. Um, and she go, all right, where's the backup disc? Oh, it's in the plane going to America. That's a problem. Okay, because we're old school. Where's the printout of the show? Oh, that's also on the plane going to America. I don't have a show. I can't do this show lighting tonight. What am I going to do? You know, now that board, which was uh, an Ari Imagine, ETC expression, same thing, had, I think, 48 faders, submasters. So I just set up like all the useful bits on the faders. And then I literally made the show up as we went along that night. Um, and I think the show looked better. I mean, it looked different, certainly. But 
because I got completely carried away, there was like a big sunset moment in the show that had always just been like a 10, you know, 30 second fade down. And now suddenly I could go, well, this is going to fade down, but then it's going to push through like pinks and ambers to the way to the there, there, there. And it just felt much more organic. And I just thought that sort of hands onness was really interesting. And it's what I think is really dangerous is when we everything becomes it's a 10 second cue or a 12 second cue or you know the actor runs down stage and you see the lights following two paces behind them because clearly the actors are running a bit quicker today you know or lame is where um if the conductor had a good party to go to that night he'd wave his stick a bit faster and the whole show would get you know 10 minutes shorter on a three and a half hour show but none of the lighting timing had changed and it just feels like what we need to, you know the advantage of learning how to do it by hand is you understand how you can have more of a feel of it and that's what makes the writing more connected to the show, I think. So I'm all for everybody should do a show on a two preset manual desk because it sort of fuels your understanding of what lighting can do and how you actually do it. You know, it's not a five second cue because it's five seconds. It's five, it's, Americans do this. American light designers never say seconds. They always say count. And I think they think a count uh, is like a bendy second. You know, it's five seconds, but a little bit quicker if the actor's walking a bit slower. But most of us don't do that. We should be able to do that more, I think. So, yeah. Okay, right. thanks. Next question. Were you involved in the Les Miserables transfer from the Palace Theatre to the Queen's, now the Sondheim? That, uh, yeah, the original Les Mis Palace to the Queen's, I did. The new Les Mis, so the one that's replaced it in the Queen's now, isn't me. But yeah, no, that transfer was... So the 97 version we talked about in the talk where we added the studio colours, that then became the standard version that did uh, Australia and Asia and somewhere else, Belgium, Germany. And then when we moved it, it wasn't really a transfer. It was sort of a new set to fit in the Queens. And then it was a, an updated version of that touring rig imposed on it, um, which added more moving lights because they're easier to deal with than conventional lights. What was interesting, I realised, because I went to watch the last night of the old Les Mis last well, a year ago now, June. Um, and so there are two side bridges, which is where the follow spots live. Uh, and what I'd forgotten until all the bright lights came up for the curtain call. And because these bridges were designed to tour, ultimately, they have wheels on the bottom and we'd never taken the wheels off. You know, so 15 years in that theatre, the wheels were still there, ready to tour. Sadly, it's now not going to happen. Um, but if you go to uh, uh, Beverly Emmons has got a really good website in New York, which is called, um, I think it's called the Backstage Archive. I can't remember, but I'll just check in a minute. And she's collecting old plans and old information about all kinds of shows. And so last year we did a really big sort of collection of information about all the sort of classic versions of Les Mis over the years, and it's all there. So you can look through every lighting plan from the original Barbican 85 version through to like the last night at the Queen's with a sort of, you know, with other paperwork, with a running commentary from me. And it's really interesting just to watch how that rig evolved over time and the control systems and the technology and everything else that went with it. Because when that show started, you know, none of this stuff existed. And when the show finished, it was lit with almost entirely this kind of technology. So have a look there. Google, do Google, it will find it for you. All right. Are you still good on time for us to keep going with questions? Yeah, okay, keep going as long as you like until you will get bored. Wonderful. All right, the next one says, know your rig, console, and show. How do you move it to a new rig in console? Uh, that's a good question. Hang on, let me just, uh, just looking up Beverly's thing. Uh, Sorry, talk about yourselves for a minute. It's called thelightingarchive.org and it's fascinating. I mean, be warned, you will vanish down a rabbit hole and you won't surface for like the next year, but it, that's fine because we've all got nothing else to do right now. So have a look there. Um, sorry, what was the question? New rig. Yeah, so um, carefully is the short answer. Um, but it's that's sort of an example of how the prep work you've done beforehand pays back. Um, because, for example, the thing I didn't touch on is what I'm always trying to get my show files to look like in my sort of cockpit drill thing uh, is for the 
they used to say in schools here that if you were doing a maths problem, you should not just write the answer, but you should show you're working. You know, so if you got the answer wrong, but you'd sort of been doing the right thing, you would still get a mark for that. So I'm always trying to show my working to myself or make the show document itself. So if I have a light, I want it to say, channel one is lighting the, um, I don't know, the radio, and it's in a smallest zoom, it's in smallest iris, the iris is sharp, it's in blue, um, and then you know everything else is in default. It's not strobing, it's not doing anything else. So that means if later on I go, oh, okay, it's in red on stage, it says blue on screen, something's wrong, I need to fix it. But what that also means is that if you switch to a different kind of light on the end of that, you don't have to go through and update the entire show. You just update the things that have changed. So you fix the color palettes and then the, that bit of the show looks right. You know, it's really crazy examples like, um, you know, again, not calling out particular manufacturers, but as an example, and I can't remember the numbers, but in a very light, zero strobe means, no, full strobe means not strobing. And in a Martin light, 10% means not strobing, full means strobing really fast. So always, if you swap from very lights to Martin lights and you just put the cue on stage, all the lights are going like this. If you can just fix your default palette to have that new value in it, then it's easy. Um, so the investing the time in advance to put the structure in place then makes that easier later on, regardless of any tools that the console claims to offer to do it for you. Um, and I think, again, we sort of didn't touch on this, but it's a decision you have to make. You know, if you're going into a venue at, you know, nine o'clock on a Saturday night to do a gig at 9.30 that nobody's ever going to see again, the important thing is that you sit down and just make the lights work and you don't care what a mess the program is. But if the show is going to have a life, you would like it to be neat and tidy so it's easy to manage over that life. And particularly if you're going to have to hand that show over to somebody else, you want it to be neat and tidy for them. Um, and it's worth investing the time to do that. And the payout, payback is every time the show moves on tour, every time you go to a different venue, every time something changes about the lights. Um, you just, I'm quite good at examples. So let me do an example by story. So Les Mis again, in fact. Les Mis, that 1997 production used um, studio colors, which were then a really new light and are still actually a really good light. And the show looked great in all the sort of subtle tinty colors that we use in that show. And it went to Australia and they said, ah, yeah, mate, we'd like to use these new studio colors. And there's that bit in your brain that's like, why, 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 why do we want to change something that works really well? And they said, ah, no, no, mate, they're all exactly the same. The light looks exactly the same. It's all the same. Everything at the front's the same. It's just the power supply is different. And we want one where we don't have to rewire it every time we go to a country with a different voltage. And we go, yeah, okay, that's fair fine and we get to Sydney and we put the disc in it was a disc then put the disc in go to the first queue and it all just feels slightly wrong and it all just feels a bit electric and it all just and the the wash that used to be really even now has like holes in the middle of the beams and it just it's all the colors are just a bit wonky but you know you go well I'm in Australia the sun's brighter outside the water goes the other way down the plug hole whatever maybe it's just my imagination but because in that show, we'd always match the color back to a real piece of gel in front of a real spotlight, a real source for tungsten, we could check and go very quickly, these aren't right. And then in conversations with high end, and you know, this is a long time ago now, so it's not knocking anybody. Um, it's the same light bulb, it's the same reflector, it's the same dichroic glass, it's the same everything, but the different power supply did a different wave of electricity, which you'd never even have thought about which moved the arc in the lamp, which is why we had holes in the beams because the optical path wasn't as good. And it made the, the color temperature of the lamp slightly different. So now all our colors are wrong. But because we had a reference, we could then just go through and fix all the colors and it was fine. But it's that sort of level of detail that if you really care about those details, you just need to be really careful of. And I think it's why at the end of the day, ultimately, despite what we've just done in Japan, somebody who knows the show really well has to go look at the show because you, the machine on its own can't do it. So that's good because it means we're all going to be in work again one day. Okay, next one. All right. What is your preferred way of ordering of lights on the light console de desk? Uh, channel numbers. Um, well, 
you know, again, historically, there's two schools of this, but I've, I've always argued for the low numbers to be the moving lights because you, you tend to type them more often. And it's just every time you don't, you type one number instead of three, it feels like it's quicker. You know, there's a generation of light designers who grew up having two different consoles who will still insist that the, the normal lights are the low numbers and the moving lights are the high up numbers, you know, and if that's the way they want to do it, that's fine. The MA still has this um, separate channel fixture thing to let you deal with that. So you can still have two channel ones if you want. Um, no, I'm really old fashioned. I'll tend to make the moving lights the low numbers and the whole rig, I'll try and structure into blocks of lights with gaps. You know, so I won't just have lights one to 100, I'll have one to 10 and then I'll have a gap and then I'll start the next slot at 21. Because what then naturally forms on the channel screen without you having to make magic sheets and things, or if you don't have the time to do that, is a sort of layout view of the rig broken down by function. And even if you can't remember that one to 10 are, whatever they are, Mac 500s, you know that they're related to them to each other and they're different from this block of lights over here and I have to confess I'm really old school that I tend to just use a 20 by 500 channel display because then I always know where to go looking for every channel because if I let the desk move channels around I never quite know where to look for the piece of information I'm trying to find um, and then the other thing is and this is the oldest American trick in the book is I'll make groups where the I'll make a set of groups which are on the touchscreen, obviously. But my thing about touchscreen consoles always has been that they draw your eye down. And if you make a mistake, you're going to be the second person to know because somebody else is going to be looking up. Whereas in the olden days, when you had desks that you could touch type on, you could do that while looking up. Um, so, you know, if I have a set of lights that are 201 to 220, there'll be a group 201 because then I can touch type it. As soon as I figure out the first channel number, I have a really quick way of selecting all of them. Um, or equally, it means there's no uh, sort of thought or translation process between these numbers and the group number. You know, the worst thing is if you look at a bunch of channels and you go, right, I think it's 201 to 220 and I've got a group to select those, but what group is that? Oh, that's group one. And it's all those little translation processes that sort of make these little delays that very quickly add up to quite big delays in what you're actually trying to do. So it's just lots of little tricks like that. Um, but yeah, it's mainly it's leaving gaps so you can find things. And then if the console lets you, you know, put a label or whatever in the patch about the channel, because the number of times I can't quite remember and I type it and the console now tells me, um, the number of times light designers go, wow, you're amazing. How do you remember all that stuff? Wow. And you go, it's on screen here. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to tell you that. I'll take the compliment, but you know, it's all those little hints that make the person you're working with think you're better than you are, I guess, are useful. Sorry, that helps. <laughs> all right, it looks like we have time for one more question. Oh, um, what's the difference? <laughs> What's the difference between the console operator, lighting programmer, and the associate or assistant LX designer in communicating with the house staff electricians? <sighs> well, that's it's interesting that because that's sort of a whole other you know, one hour session. Um, because I mean, the two parts of that are interesting. One is, I don't know if they still do it. And if they don't, maybe Martin should do it now. But MA used to do a big glossy calendar every year. Um, and each month was a show with all the credits underneath it. And the thing that fascinated me about that wasn't just those job titles you mentioned, but the number of job titles that now are connected with lighting. You know, it's the lighting designer, the lighting director, the lighting associate, the associate lighting designer, the assistant, the, you know, the TV lighting director, did, did, did. so there's lots and lots of people involved and all these jobs clearly overlap in different ways. I mean, Again, Brad will talk about the Sydney Olympics if you like, but there was a lighting designer there, John Ramont. But what I'd completely forgotten until I looked it up recently is there was another lighting designer was there um, called Rowan, who was just there to make sure it all looked good on camera. You know, that's an interesting mix as well. The second part of the long answer to this is all those jobs are sort of evolving and developing. Because the thing I haven't even really touched on is there are lots of times now when I'm the programmer, so, but I'm also the associate lighting designer whether in actual credit or not. Um, so Billy Elliot, I do both those jobs in one. I program the show, but I also do all the work that an associate would traditionally do in that I 
figure out what we need for each venue, I draw the plan, I communicate with the crew, I do the shop orders and bid lists and all of that stuff. And then I'm in the one in the venue pressing the buttons, but also having the conversation with the designers. And there's a number of people in Britain, particularly now, who do that because it's felt like if you're having all those conversations anyway, as the programmer, you know, if you're in the designer's head to that extent, you're picking up the same information that is useful um, as the associate, which is like the designer's sort of artistic assistant, I guess, traditionally. Um, so those roles sort of are, are redefining themselves quite a lot at the moment, I think. And I think somehow that's more common here than in America. Um, or for example, the national, they do it slightly differently now where they have two programmers. So one directly interacting with the designer and then another one sort of doing all the cleaning up, tidying up work in the background. So that the main programmer, lead programmer, I think they call it, isn't having to stop and deal with that stuff. They can just get on and do the show. And that's interesting as well. Um, but the actual communication, yeah. So if you're doing that, I think you all sort of need to figure out whose job it is because the danger is you, you sort of tread on other people's toes, but equally you're all on the same team and it's not a very big team. So as long as you all understand that you're all working to the same end and you're not trying to sort of, you know, piss somebody else off or steal their job. Um, I think anybody should be able to talk to anybody as long as it gets the job done quickly. You know, just, I guess the story to end on. So when we did um, something in New York, Oklahoma in New York, which was the first big, David Hersey lit musical that I'd taken to New York. And we were working there with Ted Mather, who's been David's American associate forever. And I got used in Britain to being the interface between David and the lights. Oh, I need that, I need a blue light over there. Okay, there we go. And Ted in the American way of working as the associate had got used to doing that as the associate between David and the board operator. And there was this really strange sort of working out period when we both were trying to suss out why one was trying to do the other one's job and what, you know, what, what was one of us going to end up on the scrap heap or, and ultimately we came to accept that actually we could all contribute to this conversation. David is quite amenable to having people chip in ideas and we could all be part of it. And there was enough work for all of us to do, particularly on that show in that environment, that we just became a jolly team who then kept working together on a number of shows. So like anything else, it's just about being friendly and being helpful and, not upsetting people I think um, which I realize is a complete non-answer answer but you know the main thing is and this is the main thing I learned from my two years of touring is when you walk into a new venue you know on a weekly tour into a crew who've been up all night loading out the previous show you've got about I don't know 25 seconds to get on with them and not piss them off because if you piss them off they're gonna make your life misery for the rest of the week and that's a very particular skill that really can only be learned by doing it and it can't be taught. Um, and so I sort of to answer somebody else's question as well, you know, yes, learn everything. Yes, read all the books. Yes, yes, yes. But just going out and doing shows and particularly going out and doing like weekly touring where you're somewhere different every week is the most invaluable learning experience. And that's highly recommended. All right, Rob, thank you so much for your time today and for going into this extensive Q&A session. Um, I realize we didn't get to everybody's question, but Rob, did you want to share your contact information again in case people wanted to reach out? Yeah, I'll just uh, hang on. share screen, that one. Hang on, and press that. Can you see it? Has it not done it? I can't tell. Yeah. There we go. So down there, robhalliday.com, and there's email and stuff on there. So if you go to that website, you'll find an email address. And if you want to email questions, I'm not doing much at the moment. So it will give me something to distract me from the uh, ongoing pandemic. Um, so yeah, email away. We'll see what we can come up with. Thank you so much, Rob. We really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for your time today. Um, we appreciate you, you supporting the learning sessions. And if you're interested in attending future sessions, the calendar is up on pro.harman.com. So thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thank Bye, Rob. You, Thanks, Thanks, Rob. Everyone. Great job. Enjoyed Thanks, it. Brad.